Hey, welcome back to another episode of Returning the King, where we are going chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to see what God's word really has to say about the end of the world. Today, we are in a fun topic. It is Revelation chapter 10, and that is the mighty angel and the little scroll. This has been the topic of a lot of speculation and conversation among believers, and it promises to be a, a fun episode today as we look into it. So what are we going to do today is we're going to cover uh, the question of of who is the mighty angel? We'll try to answer that as best as we can from scripture. And two, uh, this is going to be a fun thing, is what is up with eating scrolls? Uh, we'll look into the significance of that. And third, and really the most important thing, is what is the key message that's being revealed? Sometimes a lot of believers get caught up in uh, the, the identity of the angel, but miss out on the message of the angel, which is really the most important part of this. And so we want to make sure that we hone in on that there at the end. So make sure you stay tuned to the very end, because that really is the most important part of this. Uh, hey, if uh, uh, you don't mind, uh, just drop me a comment right now uh, in the comments below and let me know who you think going into this episode, who do you think the mighty angel is? Um, and maybe what do you think is the significance of the little scroll? Maybe it's, I have no idea. And that's okay. Uh, that honesty is all right. And uh, it will, it'll be fun to see uh, how the, the episode gives you some things to think about. I don't promise to be able to answer all the questions, uh, but we're going to do our very best today. Uh, so if you are new to us and have not done so, let me encourage you to subscribe uh, just to catch any of the upcoming episodes that we're doing, uh, and even to go back to some of the others that we've already done on the book of Revelation in this study. Uh, and if this uh, episode in any way kind of helps you uh, to think about something, answer some questions, if you don't mind, just like and share. Uh, liking does uh, a big thing to the YouTube algorithm that says, hey, this was helpful for me, and it might be helpful for someone else. And so if you think this is helpful in any way, it would just honor me a lot. Uh, just a big thank you uh, just to hit a like there. Uh, thank you so much. And again, I, I appreciate you taking the time to spend uh, time with me today, and we'll look forward to seeing what God's Word says. So let's dive in uh, to God's Word. If you've got your own copy, we're in Revelation chapter 10. Uh, my, uh, I'm quoting from from the English Standard Version, ESV, uh, throughout this episode, but you follow along as uh, you like. Uh, starting in verse 1, uh, it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like a pillars of fire. He had a scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So what we're seeing is that the scene has now changed. Uh, John is now given a vision on earth. So he seems to have more of an earthly perspective of seeing this mighty angel coming down uh, from heaven to where he is. Uh, if you remember back in Revelation chapter four, uh, John is given this vision. He's given this invitation to come up here. And so he's invited into the heavenly realm. And chapters four through nine seems to be from the perspective of he is at least uh, aware of the events in heaven, and he is uh, maybe in some way there in that, that trance, uh, in that vision uh, that he has, uh, but he is seeing things in the previous chapters from a heavenly perspective. Now he's seeing things from an earthly perspective. So this is probably not a future event like many of the events that we've been talking about in Revelation that are yet future. Uh, this is probably a real-time event for John. So this is probably around 90 AD. Uh, some people would date the book of Revelation and the vision there a little bit earlier, uh, pre-70 uh, AD. Uh, I tend to side with uh, Irenaeus and some of the other early church fathers that see him uh, uh, having this vision in around 90 AD. And so this means that uh, while he's on the island of Patmos that we uh, get from um, Revelation chapter 1, this is probably yet another thing that's really intended for him to give him a little bit more uh, introduction. In fact, this is uh, the second interlude that we see. So if you remember... And the kind of the broad outline, the three sets of seven judgments are tend to be broken up. Uh, we have the first six seals that are open in Revelation chapter six. 
Uh, and then we get the seventh seal in chapter um, eight, and then we get the first uh, six trumpets uh, in the rest of chapter eight and through chapter nine. And then we get the seventh trumpet uh, after a gap in uh, chapter 11. And then we have uh, three chapters of a gap there, and then we get the seven bowls of wrath. And those, so what we see is that between the sixth and the seventh seal is the first interlude. This is the sealing of the 144,000. And as we saw in a previous episode, and I'll link, uh, leave a link up here uh, where you can see uh, that one if you've missed that. Um, the the sixth seal sort of leads the, leaves us with the question dangling in the air of the wrath of the Lamb has come and who can stand? And what Revelation chapter 7, the sealing of the 144,000 does is answers that question. Now, I won't give away the spoiler. You can go watch that if you'd like to. Then we have the first six trumpets that are sounded. And again, there's another interlude, and this is what we're looking at here. And it's actually a two-part, but kind of the same thing. And it's the angel and the, the mighty angel and the little scroll, which we're looking at today. And next uh, episode, Lord willing, uh, we'll be looking at the two witnesses. And that promises to be a fun episode because there's a whole lot of ideas out there about that. Uh, and so then finally we get to the seventh trumpet. Uh, so we'll see a little bit more about why we have this interlude here, but each of these interludes is important. It's just not an arbitrary interruption. And that's what we're going to see here in chapter 10. So uh, going back to verse one, we see that John is said to have seen another mighty angel. And this gets us into that question of who is this mighty angel? Uh, so Greek uh, has a, uh, a two different words for another. Remember, the New Testament was written in Greek, um, including the book of Revelation was written in Greek. Um, and so there's actually two different words that uh, could be used. And one is alos, uh, another of the same kind. And then there's uh, heteros, which is uh, another of a different kind. The word here is alos. Uh, it's one of the same kind. So not the same one, but similar to what he has already uh, encountered before in his visions. So remember, John has already interacted with at least one mighty angel by that kind of description. And that's in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2. And this is what uh, God's word says there. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seal? So when he's in that throne room scene, scene uh, in Revelation 4, where he sees God seated on the throne, uh, the worship of the four living creatures and the 24 elders and all the angels. Then it moves into chapter 5, uh, where we see this scroll in God's hand on the throne. And this question goes out from this mighty angel, this who's worthy to open that? And so everything else plays out. So the description of that angel there is a mighty angel. Um, so here's some speculations uh, about the identity uh, of the angel. So one is uh, Michael, uh, an archangel. Uh, so again, my, uh, another mighty angel kind of leads people to think uh, that this is Michael. Now notice that I have the indefinite article and not the definite article the. A lot of uh, Christians uh, believe that uh, Michael is the archangel. He's the only one. Now this might be new for you, so hang on. Uh, but what we see is that this mighty angel here is another uh, mighty angel. So, yep, it could be an archangel. Um, but if we look in Daniel chapter 10, uh, it says that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, uh, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So this is an, an angel that is speaking uh, to Daniel and revealing why Daniel's answer to his prayer has been delayed. And apparently um, a, a spiritual uh, authority, uh, probably uh, from the dark side, if you will, uh, had delayed the angel, and it took Michael's intervention in order to release that angel and enable him to complete his mission of bringing the word from the Lord to Daniel. But the way that Michael is described here, and here's the most important thing, is that he's not the chief prince. He is one of the chief princes. Uh, so uh, people would um, maybe speculate that this is Michael that's here. Well, there's no clear mention that this is Michael. And remember, it's another mighty angel. So this would be entirely speculative. Could it be Michael? Yeah. Uh, is it definitely? No, there's nothing from the text that would clearly lead us to say that this is Michael without any kind of doubt. 
Um, the second option is that some people will say that this is Jesus that's being described here. Um, and there are similar descriptions uh, to Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. There's some overlap in the things that are mentioned about this mighty angel in chapter 10 um, and, and uh, to the descriptions of Jesus in uh, Revelation chapter 1. But here's a big problem. Jesus is never, ever called an angel in Scripture. In fact, he's said to be something entirely different from an angel. And I would just encourage you to go and read chap uh, Hebrews chapter 1, because here the contrast is made in uh, undeniable terms that uh, God makes this distinction between angels and the Son, speaking of Jesus. And so you'll hear in that this repeated thing of, uh, to which of the angels did God ever say this? Uh, but to the Son, He does say this. Uh, so there's a very clear delineator uh, between angels and Jesus. Jesus is not an angel, um, never has been an angel. Uh, now, you can go back and see, is Jesus Jehovah? One of my other episodes where I talk about Him uh, really being represented as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament but he is not an angelic being. That's a, a very different kind of uh, species than Jesus. Um, the third uh, option is that um, this is the angel that we've met in Revelation 1.1. And so this is uh, maybe the angel that has uh, been revealing things to Jesus. And going back to Revelation 1.1, you see on the right hand of your screen, it says that the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. And so uh, very clearly, there's an angelic intermediary in this process of the revealing of the, the revelations of the book of Revelation. And, and so there are some that would say this, but my question uh, is, if it were the first angel, then why would John not say the angel I saw at first instead of another mighty angel? So I think that this is kind of a weak view, doesn't really uh, stand real strong. Could it be? Yeah, but probably not uh, based on the wording that he has there in Revelation 10.1. And here's the, the fourth, is that it's an unnamed different angel. And this is where I would land, is that it's just simply an angel. Um, if you can say simple and an angel, that's mighty all in the same sentence. Uh, but it, it, it's really uh, an anonymous angel. We are not given the name uh, of the angel. Uh, in fact, if you look throughout most of Scripture, most angels operate anonymously. We have very, very few names that are mentioned of angels in Scripture. Do angels have names? Yes, absolutely. We know Michael. We know Gabriel. Um, now, we could go to some extra biblical text and get some other ideas of angels, uh, but that's not divinely revealed, and so I don't really hold to those sources, but it does, does help to reinforce that idea uh, that angels do have unique identities and unique names. But the vast majority of them, in all the angelic encounters that you have in Scripture, most of them are done anonymously. And here's the key. Greatness, mightiness in the kingdom of God is never measured by how many people know your name. It's all about being faithful to the Lord and what he has for us. And so I, I would say, just as a caution, there's really not a need to ass assign a name or particular identity. I think there are identities that we can stay away from, like Jesus. That's clearly not it. Uh, but as far as the, the, the name of the angel, it's unimportant. If it were important, God would have told us, John would have had that revealed to him to reveal to us if it were important. What's more important is what the angel says, not who the angel is. So next we see... Uh, that the angel's feet are on the land and the sea. Now, this is significant. This is not just some, wow, it's so big, you know, and, and, and look how tall he is. Uh, but this is significant in uh, what is trying to convey in this. So this is kind of a, a weird depiction uh, that I found of the mighty angel, but as you know, close to accurate as some of those descriptors with the rainbow and the foot on the land and the sea and so forth. Uh, but don't get caught too caught up in that. That's just a representation. Uh, verse 2, uh, he, the mighty angel, had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea 
and his left foot on the land. So the enormity, the huge size of this angel speaks to the greatness of his might. Um, now, we're not ever told in scripture how tall an angel is. Um, uh, we see that they most times have the appearance of a human uh, without wings, without halos uh, in scripture. Um, and so we want to kind of get away from mythology, even Christ Christian mythology, about different ideas about what angels look like and how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. This was really a thing that uh, middle-aged theologians spent a lot of time uh, about, weird. Uh, but the, the, I think the, the angels can have that size reflective of their rank, their authority, their power, and more than anything, if it's just simply intended to give us the idea, which is a lot of the symbolism in the book of Old Test uh, or the book of Revelation, is that this is intended to, to show us he is a great angel. He is mighty, he is strong. And so this is an important, not an unimportant angel that has given this message to uh, John. But here's the most important is the placement uh, of his feet on the land and the, sea, uh, and the sea indicates his message is for the whole world. Uh, this is the, the realm of uh, created beings where humans would tend to occupy, um, you know, at least temporarily. At that time, they would occupy the land primarily and the sea, at least on a boat. Uh, they weren't flying back then, so not in the air. Uh, so this is a message for all of humanity to be able to hear. So we want to pay attention to that in just a moment. Now, when the angel speaks, verses 3 and 4 reveals an interesting effect, um, that there's a response to this. Uh, and verse 3 says, they called out, the, the angel called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, uh, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So when the angel shouts, the seven thunders will speak. Uh, thunder is oftentimes connected with divine judgment. Um, so the seven thunders seem ready to bring God's righteous judgment on those who have refused God's love and grace. Uh, that this is almost like, and, and certainly when we see what the message is, we see that this is like ready to pounce. It is ready to go. Um, and so there is certainly that, that aspect of uh, thunder being um, conveyed with God's presence. So we see this on Mount Sinai, that when God appeared to Moses and the people of Israel, thunder was a big part of that. And a lot of times uh, throughout the Old Testament, we see this uh, thunder connected with judgment. So there seems to be that readiness there. But the thunder speak, they said something audible, said something clear uh, that was uh, able to be uh, understood, but John was not allowed to write it down. So it was intelligible speech. It wasn't just boom, boom, thunder uh, sounding, but it was intelligible speech. And, and so the, what the seven thunders revealed is not for us to know. And we see this also in the book of Daniel, that there are things that Daniel, as the prophet, had the, the privilege of the awareness, but was uh, not permitted to pass that on to us. Uh, and so here's a key point in scripture, uh, in prophecy, is that God has not told us everything. And I don't think he will, but what he has told us is absolutely sufficient. It's what we need to know. And so while our, our human curiosity wants to kind of reach out into the dark areas, the gaps in scripture, uh, where we don't have all the details and try to fill that in, we need to be careful about that, that we're not allowing our speculation to become on par with revelation. So what we've been told is absolutely enough. God is the one who gets to choose uh, what we are told. And it's not for us to try to fill in all the blanks. Now, yes, he has given us a lot of clues where we can kind of hit on some of those uh, and fill in some of the blanks, uh, but he has not revealed everything. And no, he is not going to bring about prophets today to do uh, to fill in those blanks for us. Everything that he has said in the book of Revelation is complete. Uh, and that's what we need to, to take to heart is that God is sovereign. Uh, God is gracious. He has told us enough to know so that we can be ready, uh, but he's not going to tell us everything and has not told us everything. And we can be comfortable with that um, as much as we can. Now we get to that weird, weird moment uh, in verses eight through 11. So we're skipping a little bit because that's the main part. 
because the significance of what he's doing really helps us to understand uh, what he talks about as the main part, verses five through seven. So let's talk about what's what's up with eating the scroll. So starting in verse eight, uh, it says, then the voice that I'd heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, go take the scroll that is opened in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So remember, this angel had a scroll in his hand that was open. So uh, I went uh, to the angel, verse 9, and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So John is told to take and eat the little scroll, the little book, uh, depending on your translation. It, it'll either say scroll, little scroll, or little book, uh, depending on which translation you're using. Both are meaning really the same thing. Um, and, and so he is given this little book, this little scroll, and he's told to eat that, and he does. Um, and so verse 10, and I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So it, he is told it's going to be sweet uh, to the taste, sour to his stomach, and that's exactly what it was like. He ate it. It was sweet to eat, uh, but it soured his stomach. Uh, so uh, just to make the distinction here, this scroll that, or the little scroll, little book that he has is not the seven sealed scroll of destiny that we see in Revelation chapters five and six. So this is the, that scroll is the one that is in uh, the hand of God on the throne that the lamb alone is worthy to open. Uh, so the word that's used there is biblion, which is the Greek word for book. Uh, but this word here uh, is a little scroll or a little book. It's uh, Biblaridion, uh, which is kind of the diminutive form, tiny book, little book um, of whatever particular revelation that this is. Uh, but this is not the first time that we've encountered something like this. Um, we have seen this before in the Old Testament, and the significance is here in the act that this is a prophet's commission to preach God's word. So uh, Ezekiel uh, 2, 8 through 3, 9 is another place where we see this. And what basically we're seeing is that God is putting his word into John's mouth and commissioned him to speak and notice that word again. So he's already been speaking. He's already been revealing, but he's given some additional revelation uh, that will be repeated uh, as we get into the rest of the book of Revelation. So let's go back over into Ezekiel and see Ezekiel's commission, his experience with this. So starting in verse 9, Ezekiel says, And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and woe. Notice that. These are not happy words uh, that are being there, words of lamentation and woe. And he said to me, son of man, eat whatever you find here, eat the scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, uh, son of man, feed your belly with the scroll that I give you to fill your stomach with it. And I ate and in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. So we're seeing that prophetic uh, commission, that prophetic call that Ezekiel has been given these words. And symbolically, he is ingesting, taking into him the words of God. Um, so what John is revealing here is God's word, and it is absolutely reliable. This is what we go to for real truth. And this is why we in the study that we're doing are trying to stick with what revelation has to say rather than going with what speculations have to say. And we're trying to stay away from systems and stick with scripture. Uh, and there are, like we said, there are places where we don't know all the answers. Uh, we'll cover some of the speculations there, uh, but there are some things that are difficult to understand as we go. Um, and understand from John's perspective that what John is revealing is not easy to say, um, that these are difficult words, just like Ezekiel was given words of lamentation and woe. Uh, the reason why John's stomach is soured here is because, yes, God's word is sweet, it's wonderful, 
but it's still not an easy thing uh, to say. So the prophet's job of delivering messages of truth is not always very pleasant. Uh, this is that sour stomach. There is no delight in the prophet and destruction, even of the wicked. There's there's still some of that heart of God, and God does not delight in the death of the wicked. And, and so in the same way, there's that, that heart that humans uh, facing judgment would turn away from God's judgment, but that doesn't mean that we soften the words uh, that we are to give. We need to be faithful um, messengers of the word of God. We need to be faithfully telling uh, people about the truth of God's word. But that doesn't mean that we soften it. We don't soft pedal it. Uh, we don't try to water it down uh, because it's not always pleasant to deliver the message, but we need to deliver the message for the sake of the hearer. And this is part of what John is doing. He's given a very difficult message. There's a lot of dark places of judgment in the book of Revelation. And it doesn't mean that John was absolutely delighting and giddy about this, but that there is that aspect that he understands, he feels the weight of the, the words that he has been given to speak. So here's some application. God's word is sweet to us. Uh, we should have the attitude of Jeremiah uh, and Psalm 119. We need to feast on the word. We need to spend time in the word, not just in the book of Revelation. Uh, some people spend all of their time there, and that is not healthy at all. There's 65 other books in the Bible uh, that we need to be spending a lot of time in to understand who God is, uh, who we are, and how we need to live in a right relationship with him. Uh, so feast on the word. Feast daily. As often as you like to eat food, uh, eat the word. Uh, we hear in Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Oftentimes at a Jewish Sabbath meal, uh, you'll see a jar of honey on the table. And when the young children um, have come of age where they're able to read the scripture, oftentimes after they've read from God's word, um, uh, the, the, the father will take a, a, a drop of honey from the jar and put it on their tongue to remind them that God's word is sweet. And so let's crave it as a sweetness that it is. Uh, Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, your words were found and I ate them. Hmm. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So we need to be faithful uh, to take in the word, and we need to be faithful to warn people of God's wrath and share the gospel even when the message is uncomfortable. You know, when Paul uh, talks about in, in Romans chapter 1, um, that he is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation for everyone uh, who believes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, uh, because in it, a righteousness by faith is being revealed from the start to the finish, from faith to faith. But the very first thing that he tells um, about the gospel is the wrath of God. The very next verse says, and the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And he spends the better part of the next chapter and a half, two chapters, talking about the wrath of God. It's a critical part of the gospel. And so we need to be faithful to share, even when it's hard, even when people don't like it, and uh, even when people um, push back on it. So may the Lord make us all faithful. Um, evangelism can be stomach churning sometimes. It's not easy to tell people uh, of their, their standing with God. And that doesn't mean that we do it in a mean way. It's a very gracious thing of one sinner to another, from one person, uh, one blind man to another who's found sight, um, you know, from one person who uh, was lost and, and hell bound um, to another uh, that is on their way. And yet there is hope. Um, and, and it's very, very uh, challenging sometimes to do that, but we need to be faithful, even when we've got the butterflies and the rocks and the fear and all those things, um, uh, just to be faithful to share. Um, now, here again, we're getting into the main part of this message. And in, in uh, verse 11, and I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Uh, so chapters 12 and following uh, are going to tell us of the ancient war between these two kingdoms, uh, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God versus the domain of darkness. And we see that this is a very ancient cosmic war. This will be interesting when we get into those chapters, but you'll see another interlude uh, that is three chapters long where we are given this big picture perspective. And so John is going to be telling us some 
uh, things again uh, that, that have been going on. Now, let me pause right here. If you've got questions or comments so far, if you think I'm wrong, go ahead, leave that in there. I can take it. Uh, but if there's been something that has um, just kind of stirred your mind, uh, let me invite you to, uh, to drop that down. We're not done. We're getting into the main part, but I just wanted to pause here and just remind you, I love the interaction. Uh, if you leave me a question or comment, usually within the first day or two, if it's not on a Sunday, uh, then I am glad to try to um, answer those and, and do try to answer uh, all those, particularly the, the questions that are earnest questions. And I, I'm always glad to help out. So please leave those. And again, uh, if you found anything helpful so far or in the rest of the video, please like and share and subscribe to the channel. Love to have you uh, as a part of the, uh, the, the, the channel fam here. Uh, now we're getting to the main part, the key message. So hang on tight. This is it. So uh, notice that the angel takes a moment um, and, 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 and Daniel chapter 12, uh, we also see the same kind of thing. Uh, but here we see the angel raising his right hand and swears an oath, like an angel needs to do this. Uh, but what he is saying is coming straight from the eternal creator. Uh, it's an accurate and certain message. There's no question about it. So in the the, the angel's messaging, uh, there is no fickleness about this, that he is going through these motions to assure John and us as the hearers now that we need to pay attention and listen closely. And so here is the main point. Again, it's not who the angel is, it's what the angel reveals. So here's the message. So the first interlude, as we talked about, answers the, the stated question of seal number six, who can survive God's wrath? The first interlude is the sealing of the, um, the 144,000. And what we see is it's only the 144,000 who can stand the wrath of God. Uh, and again, go back and watch that for more. In Revelation chapter nine, this is the, the sixth trumpet. Uh, it says this, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues and did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, of their sorceries or of their sexual immoralities or of their thefts. So kind of what's implied in, in this section uh, or in the sixth trumpet is who uh, will God be patient with the unrepentant and rebellious humanity forever? It's kind of what's kind of lingering in that, that trumpet and the commentary about it. And what we're going to see is that the second interlude is going to answer this with a resounding no. Absolutely not. That God will not remain patient forever, that there is coming an end to his patience, and that's what's about to be renounced. In verse 6 of chapter 10, there will be no more delay. God's patience with rebellious humanity is about to end. And that's a sobering message throughout the book of Revelation that things will not continue on where it seems like the wicked are unpunished and unchecked in this world. And this is part of the hope that we have in the book of Revelation is that there is coming a day when the unrighteous will meet their righteous judgment, where they will meet their righteous end. And there's this call in there for the unrighteous to repent. Uh, but as we saw in the sixth trumpet, that many of them, despite all the horrible things that are going on, the cataclysmic events that are happening are still so stubborn, still so hard and rebellious in their hearts against God that they refuse to repent and to turn to God. And so God's prophetic word will be finally fulfilled at the seventh trumpet. That's what's being messaged here, that the finality of it actually comes with the seventh trumpet. So Revelation 10, verse 7, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced it to his servants, the prophets. So let me just hit on this word mystery. Mystery doesn't seem mean something that's not um, uh, knowable. It's not something that is unknowable. A mystery is something that cannot be known unless God reveals it. Uh, human reason cannot get up to figuring out a mystery of God. This is something that God knows and that only God can know. 
and only we can know if God reveals it. So this is what the New Testament means whenever it says a mystery. And so this is uh, what, what it's been saying is that all these things that God has been warning the world about, uh, his coming judgment from the very, very ancient times is about to happen. And this is what is being announced by the mighty angel is like, listen up, final warning, when the seventh trumpet blows, it's too late. Now, in another episode, we'll, we'll show the connection. We kind of alluded to this when we talked about the, the sixth and seventh seal, is that the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl seems to be where all three sets of judgments meet. That I think, and this is kind of my best understanding of this, is that all three of those are one in the same event. This is why here in the middle, we can have him saying, this is where it's all going to be fulfilled. So ca catch that uh, here on that, that video if you would like to see more. But here's the thing. With this warning, the inhabitants of the world will be without excuse. And are you ready? So there is certainly a lot of sobering things that are said in the book of Revelation. And if you're watching just because you're curious about how the world is going to end, but you've never come to a place where you have turned from your sin and turned to Christ, now is your time to do that. If you want to reach out to me in the comments, um, I'd be glad to, to walk you through that. But if you are there, you already know that your place is secure. How about those around you? Do they know? Are you being faithful? Even with the stomach turning message that we have being faithful to let them know, because that's really our key mission here. This is why God doesn't take us away the moment that we're saved. He saved us on purpose, and he saved us for purpose. And that pur purpose is to make the kingdom bigger and stronger if we'll let him use us. And so I hope you will. And I again, I uh, am so glad that you've watched. So now that you've seen all this, and maybe you came in with no idea at all, who do you think the angel is now? Uh, and what do you think is the significance of the little scroll and the eating of the scroll? Uh, so thanks for watching again. Please uh, leave a thumbs up if this gave you anything at all to think about. If it kind of stirred your thinking in mind and you're ready to go into Revelation 10 and look at that, uh, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss our next episode, which is going to be the two witnesses. Wow, there's a lot of stuff in there, and I'm excited about that. Hey, again, if you've got any questions, comments, leave those below. Until then, thank you so much for watching. May the Lord richly, richly bless you, and we'll see you again, Lord willing, next time.